Hey guys, welcome back. Depending on what you're planting and depending on where you're located in the country, we could either be in the middle or the tail end of the fall food plot planting season. But because there, there's still probably a few of you guys out there that still need to plant your fall plots, I thought this week it'd be a good idea to talk about some food plot planting tips in this week's video. So we're not gonna be talking about creating a food plot. So we're not gonna be talking about the location of a plot, sunlight, soil testing, anything like that. Now, those are all very important steps to having a successful food plot, but hopefully those steps have already been taken care of. So again, in this video, we are just gonna be talking about tips for planting your food plots. And the first thing that I wanna talk about should have already been taken care of previously, and that's having good weed control coming into fall planting season. And this is important for a few reasons. The first is because you wanna have good seed to soil contact. If you have a bunch of grass and a bunch of broadleaf weeds in your food plot, it's gonna be a lot harder for your seeds as you broadcast them into the food plot to find the soil. So hopefully you guys have planned ahead and tried your best to eliminate the weeds in your food plot. And the second reason why eliminating weeds in your food plot is so important is because you do not want those weeds growing in your fall plot. You want whatever it is you're planting to be growing in your fall plot. Now, there are a lot of people out there that will say, you know, the weeds in your food plot are deer food. And, you know, depending on the time of year, they're not wrong. During the summer, most of what's in your food plot, whether you planted it for deer or not, the deer will browse on it. But as we transition into the fall and it starts getting a little colder outside, a lot of those weeds are gonna die back and they were taking up space in your food plot. So all those plants that would have grown into the fall are no longer growing and you're gonna have holes in your food plot and you're gonna have a missed opportunity and your plot's not gonna perform nearly as well. So I try my best in the late spring and summer to address the weeds in my fall food plots. So not only do I have great seed to soil contact when I'm seeding, but also so I don't have a lot of weeds in my plot competing with what I'm trying to grow for the deer. And guys, there are plenty of ways to address the weeds in your food plot. It, it's just really what you guys are comfortable doing and, and what works with your food plot system. You guys can use herbicide a few different times throughout the summer. If you guys uh, are used to tilling or disking your plots and that's your method, you can disk your plots a few different times a year. That'll most likely kill a lot of the weeds. Or you can also use a summer cover crop like buckwheat if you're interested in more of the no-till option. And that buckwheat will smother and choke out most of the weeds. And each one of these methods will allow you to have great seed to soil contact as you're seeding your fall food plot. The second tip that I have for you guys also relates to something that you guys should have already done and it relates to a soil test. And so hopefully you have a soil test from either last fall or the spring and you've been working on amending your pH. But now is also a great time to be fertilizing your food plot as you are seeding your fall plot. And guys, all I can really say with that is make sure that you follow your soil test depending on the nutrients in your soil and depending on what you're planting, it's gonna call for different fertilization requirements. Uh, in general, brassicas like more nitrogen, clovers like more potassium. But again, when you're planting, make sure that you're following your soil test recommendations when it comes to fertilizer. So now that we have our weeds taken care of, we're gonna have great seed to soil contact in our, in our fall plot. Uh, we, we have our soil test recommendations for fertilizer ready to go but what should we be planting in our fall food plots? And everyone's gonna tell you their favorite food plot and give you a recommendation on what to plant, but I'm not gonna tell you to plant this over that. The only thing that I'm gonna tell you is when you're planting your fall food plot, or really any food plot, is make sure to plant a variety instead of just a single crop. So if you're interested in planting a brassica food plot, don't just plant turnips in your food plot, don't just plant rape, or don't just plant radish try to find a blend that has a lot of different variety within the brassica family to plant within your food plot. And the same thing goes with an annual or perennial clover plot. Don't just plant ladino clover. Don't just plant durana clover. Try to find a mix that has variety. Try to find a couple different perennials or a couple different annuals to plant within your clover plot. Or you don't even necessarily have to have just clover. Mix the clovers with cereal grains. Again, try to have as much variety as possible within your food plot. And there's a few reasons why you wanna have a lot of variety with your food plot. The first reason is deer really like to browse on everything and they love variety. If you have a food plot with a lot of different types of brassica in it or a lot of different types of clover, that food plot's gonna be much more attractive to the deer herd. Different plants are gonna be palatable at different times throughout the season. So as 
one plant is attractive early, another plant might be attractive later. And so if, if you just have something that is an early season attraction but no late season attraction, then your food plot might not have as much activity throughout the entire season. So the more diversity you have within your food plot, the more attractive it is throughout the entire season. And it's not always just an early season versus late season food source thing. Sometimes it's just deer to deer. Some deer really want this and some deer really want that. So if you can do your best to provide just a little bit of everything, your food plot is not only gonna be attractive throughout a majority of the season, but also to a majority of the deer herd within your area. So it's not only important to add diversity to your food plot for the deer and the level of attraction it has to them, but it's also important to add diversity for the overall success of your food plot on whether or not it's going to grow. Certain crops grow better in certain types of soils and certain pH levels. So the more variety that you add to your food plot, the greater chance you have of having a successful food plot. Take this particular clover plot, for example. We have three different types of clover within this plot right now. We have Ladino clover, we have Elsite clover, and we have Dutch clover. Those three different types of clover are going to perform differently depending on the pH level, depending on the soil type, how much moisture is in the soil. For example, Elsite clover really likes wet ground, so every once in a while this ground gets a little bit saturated and maybe those other clovers don't respond well to that. The Elsite clover will respond well to that and will still have a great clover plot. But in other areas of the plot where maybe it doesn't get as saturated, maybe the white Dutch clover does better. Maybe the, the Ladino clover does better in a different area. So even though for the most part this is just a clover plot, by adding different types of perennial clover, we're setting ourselves up better to have success. Again, depending on what the pH is or what the soil type is in various spots of this food plot. So guys, diversity within your food plot is very important. And for the most part, when you're looking at these different food plot companies and the blends that they're putting out, a lot of these blends are very diverse blends. So if you're, if you're looking at a perennial clover blend, a lot of times they will have multiple different types of clover within the blend. Just turn the bag over, look at the seed tag, and you'll be able to see exactly what's in that blend. And the same thing with a lot of brassica blends now, it's, it's not just radish, it's not just turnip. They'll have a, a lot of different types of brassicas within that blend. And that kind of brings me to the next thing I want to talk about is where should you buy your food plot seeds? There are so many companies out there and a lot of times when you, when you look at the what's in the bag, a lot of these mixes are, are not that good. It, it seems like they're charging way too much for what's in the bag and sometimes what's in the bag isn't even what should be planted in your food plot. And so I can definitely see how it can be tricky for somebody who hasn't planted a lot of food plots or maybe they're new to food plots on, on where to buy their seeds from. And I wanna start off by saying that I'm not sponsored by anyone, so food plot companies would fall under the umbrella of anybody. And so if I mention somebody's name or a company's name, it's not that they're paying me, it's just that I've used their seeds in the past and I've had great results with their products. And really over the past 10 years of planting food plots, I've really only used two different companies. The first is Whitetail Institute. I, I bought their products for several years. I've, I've never had a problem. I've always had great results. So if you're someone that is interested in looking for a, a reputable food plot company to buy their seeds from, I would definitely recommend Whitetail Institute. Another one in this company is local to Michigan and that's Northwoods Whitetail. We bought their seeds for several years as well and again, always had great results. So that's another company that if you're set on buying seeds from a food plot company, that I would definitely recommend. That being said, one thing that not very many people talk about, uh, most likely because they're getting paid by the food plot companies, is that you don't have to buy your seed from any particular company. What I've been doing for the past three years, since we've owned this piece of property right here, is I've been buying all of my seeds from the local co-op, from a local farmer's elevator. And for the most part, I'm not gonna say every single time, where your local co-op or the local farmer's elevator is getting their seeds is the same place that these food plot companies are getting their seeds from. Now again, I don't wanna say that every single time it's gonna be coming from the same place, and I don't know for sure if every co-op or farmer's elevator is doing the type of germ tests that a lot of these food plot companies do, but for the most part, the seeds that you're gonna find down at the local co-op are very similar to the seeds that you're gonna find within the blends from the food plot companies. And so that's what I've been doing for the past few years. I've been mixing my own blends and finding my seeds down at the local co-op or the local farmer's elevator. And most of the food plots that you guys have seen on this channel have been from this property. And all the food plots on this property have been planted with seeds from the local co-op. I think the only seeds that have come from a food plot company have been the screening seeds, whether that's been an annual screen or our switchgrass screen. And we also planted Miscanthus rhizomes. But other than that, everything else that's been related to our food plots and within our food plots has come from the local co-op. 
And so hopefully that gives you guys another option when you're trying to figure out where to buy your food plot seeds. And another fun thing about that is you get to mix your own blends. You can try to see what works, what doesn't, and just experiment. It's really fun to go in and create your own mix. And just remember that the nearest co-op is where a lot of the local farmers are going to buy their seeds. And they depend on those seeds to perform because that's how they earn an income. So the way I look at it is if it's good enough for my neighbor who's a farmer and he's willing to bet his income on the performance of these seeds, then it's good enough for the food plot on my hunting property. So now that you have your diverse food plot blend picked out, whatever that might be, now let's talk about actually seeding your food plot. And the one tip that I have as far as seeding goes is try to make sure that you're separating your seeds by size. So if you're using one of those little crank spreaders, if you have a smaller plot or if you're using an over the shoulder bag spreader, you wanna make sure that you're separating your seeds by the size of the seed. And this might mean that you're gonna be walking through and seeding your plot a few different times, and it's going to take longer, but it's going to be worth it. And the reason you wanna be separating your seeds by size is because as you're seeding your plot, you have to open the gate on your spreader so that the, the largest seed can fall through the bottom. Cereal grain and clover plot, for example. If you're gonna be throwing oats in a plot along with clover, the oats seed is a lot bigger than the clover seed. And even a perennial clover seed is smaller than an annual clover seed, but that's a lot closer than let's say an annual clover seed to oats. You have to open up your spreader large enough for that oat seed to fall through the bottom. And while your oat seeds might be spreading out consistently, those tiny clover seeds, they, they are most likely gonna be coming out of your spreader way too fast. You could potentially go through all of the smaller clover seeds before you're finished seeding those larger oat seeds. And it does not have to be oats and clover. It's really any time you're trying to plant a food plot with both a large seed and a small seed. Brassica is, a, is another example of, of a smaller seed. And so for me, because I like to make my own mixes down at the local co-op, it's very important that I don't combine the larger seeds with the smaller seeds. And so that's one thing you wanna watch out for if you are going to create your own mixes or if you happen to buy a food plot blend from a food plot company and you see there's different size seeds in the same bag. A lot of those smaller seeds are gonna go through the spreader a lot faster than those larger seeds. The next thing I wanna talk about is related to something we, we talked about earlier with, with seed to soil contact, and that's after you seed to make sure that you're pressing that seed onto the soil. And, and there's a few ways you can do this, and depending on your planting method, you know, th there's a few different ways that you wanna be doing this. So if you're somebody who's tilling or disking the soil, you wanna be packing that seed bed down to firm it up before you seed, so, that, that, so you till or disk, pack, then seed, and then after you seed, you wanna be packing that seed down again, either with a calta packer or a lawn roller, or you, you can drive over it with your tractor tires or your ATV tires or your truck tires, anything really just to pack that seed onto the soil. You wanna make sure that that seed has great seed to soil contact. For those of you guys that are doing more of the no-till approach, that are, that are using buckwheat as a summer cover crop, a lot of times with that, you're gonna have great seed to soil contact just by default because that buckwheat is gonna smother all the weeds. You can spread your seed into the standing buckwheat, but then you need to terminate the buckwheat. So then what you wanna do, again, is run over it with a calta packer, with a lawn roller. I feel that a lawn roller works a little bit better than a calta packer because the calta packer has those ribs in it, and so there's gonna be times where the buckwheat you're gonna miss some buckwheat within those ribs. Where a lawn roller on the buckwheat, that's just gonna smash it straight down. Now, if you did wanna run over a couple times with the Culta Packer, that would work just fine. But if you don't have a Culta Packer and you just have a lawn roller like me, that gets the job done as well. This particular food plot that we're standing in right now, we used a method called throw and mow. This is a perennial clover plot. I'm sure you've seen it in a lot of our different videos. You can see that it's pretty much straight clover. And we seeded a fall food plot mix into this food plot. So we seeded annual clovers, tillage radish, oats, and then we mowed the clover down pretty short right before a pretty good rain and the combination of the vibrations from the mower along with the driving rain right after we finished mowing, most of those seeds made it down to the soil and we had a great catch on this food plot. And if you guys want me to, I can do a completely separate video just focusing on throw and mow food plots. So if that's something you're interested in, just let me know in the comments. But that's what we use to get good seed to soil contact and plant this particular fall food plot. 
The next food plot planting tip is probably one of the most important food plot planting tips there is, and that's that you need to be planting before some sort of a rain event. Even if that means you're not planting exactly when you want to, like I normally start thinking about planting my food plots at the start of August, but we did not plant our food plots until probably I think the 10th of August this year, just because we didn't have rain in the forecast. And if you seed your fall food plots without rain in the forecast, uh, one of a few things can happen. One, those seeds are gonna be sitting on top of your food plot for a lot longer, giving the local wildlife a lot more opportunities to come and eat your seeds. I, I can just think about the turkeys on this property. We've got a group of about 40 turkeys, most of them are poles, but they're in, in these food plots bugging around every single day. If those turkeys had access to a food plot with seeds sitting out for 10 days, there's a good chance they would eat most of the larger seeds out of that food plot. The second reason that you wanna be waiting for a good rain to plant your food plots is because if you don't wait for a rain, there's still a decent chance that your food plot will germinate with the morning dew. However, if this is how your food plot is germinating, if you don't have rain in the near future, your food plot is gonna get started, it's gonna germinate, but the seeds are gonna most likely die from a lack of moisture. So try your best to not plant by the calendar and plant by the forecast and wait for rain before you seed your fall food plots. And when I am checking the weather to determine when I'm gonna be planting my food plots, there are a few places that I go to check the forecast. And that's what I wanted to talk about next. You know, some of the better places that you can go to check the forecast, some of the more accurate ones, and then also my favorite app for checking the weather. I have an iPhone, so right off the bat, I will just check the weather app that comes pre-installed on the iPhone. But once I kind of get an idea as to when those storms are gonna be moving through, let's say it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then I'm gonna be going to other websites to try to get it narrowed down to a, to a time. And then I'll kind of go to a, either AccuWeather or my favorite app is an app called Dark Sky. I, I think a, AccuWeather is free, so if you don't want to pay for anything, then AccuWeather might be the way to go. But I really like the app Dark Sky just because it seems like it's very, very reliable and it, it can predict the weather and the precipitation to the minute. Again, I'm not sponsored by anyone that includes the app Dark Sky, but I, I do think that that is probably one of the better apps at predicting precipitation and letting you know exactly how much is coming. I want to apologize, guys. I, I do not remember how much the app costs. I bought it five years ago. It was a one-time buy, but I, I want to say it was anywhere from $5 to $7. And, and to me, a $7 purchase, one-time buy for, for one of the most accurate weather apps was worth it in my book, especially when it comes to planting food plots and also during the hunting season. If you really want to get at the tail end of precipitation to walk to your hunting stand right after that rain is done, this is a great app. It's going to tell you when the rain's going to start. It's going to tell you when the rain's going to end. It's going to tell you if it's heavy, medium, or light rain. It's, it's an all-around great app. Again, not just for food plotting, but, but for hunting in general. And the last tip that I have for you guys as it relates to food plot planting is to try your best to take notes from year to year. Obviously you wanna be saving your soil test so you can be monitoring your progression within the soil, but also take notes at the deer use. You know, how did everything grow? What worked, what didn't work so well? And, and this way you can really hone in on creating your own blends if that's something that you wanted to do, or you can, you can switch up what you wanna plant in certain areas. So try your best to take notes, save those soil tests, write down what you planted in each plot each year and, and just compare the usage of each plot year by year and eventually you're gonna be able to figure out what works well for the deer in your area and for your property. Well guys, that pretty much wraps it up for our food plot planting tips. If you guys have any additional tips or if you guys have any questions, please leave those in the comment section below. I'll get back to those as soon as I can and we will see you guys in the next video.